Well, welcome to the Word Network. I am Mark Moore Jr. and this is Young Leaders Live. Listen, we want you to do us a favor. Get on your Instagram, your Facebook, your Twitter, even go find your MySpace password and log in and tell somebody that YLC is on the air. We have an amazing program tonight for the next hour and a half. We are going to be taking a journey into a conversation about the state of the church. I'm not by myself. I have some amazing men and women, 15 of the greatest thinkers, minds in ministry, media, marketplace in our generation. They have joined me tonight. They have come from all over the country, right here to Detroit, Michigan, to come to you through the Word Network world headquarters but before we get into any of that i need you all at home to help me celebrate and thank god for the word network and mr kevin adele our ceo as well as mr dave sheffield our operations manager and the entire team right here helping take the gospel to the world you've got time to hurry and tell a neighbor tell a friend that we are on the air we are excited because at this moment live from the word network we are seven days away from what i will believe will be the conference of the year. 5,000 plus people from 49 states and 20 plus countries have registered to meet us in Atlanta at the Young Leaders Conference. We have made room at the cross and at the conference for you. You can go now to www.exploreylc.com. We have made more room in the convention center for you and yours. So register tonight before even the overflow is gone. I don't want to waste any more time on preliminaries and protocols because we have much to discuss tonight. But I want to introduce you to some of our incredible gifts that are making this conversation what it is and what it will be tonight. But before we introduce them, you know at home and, and certainly the entire world is paying attention to where we are right now. And if we ever needed the Lord, we need the Lord right now. While this particular episode is not a preaching show, there is no musical guest, there is no praise break on the itinerary. This is a conversation, but in all of our ways, we want to acknowledge him. I'm going to ask my friend and brother, Pastor James Tyson of Indianapolis, Indiana, the Christ Church there, to lead us in a quick word of prayer. And listen to me very carefully. You might be someone that needs a prayer request answered. You need something that only the God of glory can do. Your degree, your last name, your education, the little bit of money in your bank account will not get it done. You have a God-sized problem. I've got good news for you. Your God-sized problem, I know the God that can get it done, and his name is Jesus. Before we do anything tonight with reflection of where the world is, our country, our society, I want us to look to the Lord in prayer. And if you're watching on Facebook, put your name, your prayer request, your business, your church, whoever, whatever it is that you want us to pray for. And I'm believing that there's a global community that's tuning in right now that's going to join in prayer for that need to be met. Pastor Tyson, before we do any introductions, would you take us to the throne of grace? Father, we bless you and we thank you for another opportunity that you have given us to be able to call upon your wonderful and blessed name. Father, you are a mighty God. You are a sovereign king. And we appreciate you for your greatness, your mercy, and your love that you have extended to us. Father, I thank you for this moment, oh God, that you have allowed us, oh God, to come into homes all around the world and God, to be able to share your gospel and to be able to share the light of the kingdom, God, to everyone that may hear it. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, God, that your presence would be with us, God, during this time that we are on the air. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that the glory of God would not only reveal itself in this studio, but let it reveal itself wherever an individual is watching in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, I ask you, oh God, that whatever the need is, that those that are watching, oh God, whether it is on television, Father, whether it is online or what have you, I pray that you would meet them at the point of their need. Father, I thank you, oh God, that you will supply all of our need according to your riches in glory. Thank you, hallelujah, that there is not, oh God, any lack in you that you cannot meet us right where we are so father i ask you god that as we share oh god as we reflect ourselves oh god through a kingdom message i pray oh god that you would anoint everyone on this panel give us the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of knowledge help us oh god to not only oh god speak out of our opinion but to be able to speak your mind with pure motive and with clear understanding father i ask you that you would bless oh god pastor mark god continue to anoint him and his mind and his team as well i pray that you would launch him oh god into a new dimension and take us oh god where we need to go next in you so father we open up this opportunity 
O oh God, for you to do whatever it is that you want to do. Father, you have free reign, O oh God, to flow, O oh God, in this room. So, Father, we ask you, get all the glory, get all the honor, and let someone be saved as a result of this, of this program. And, Father, we'll bless you and we'll honor you. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. I feel, I feel better already. I feel better already. And I want to jump into the conversation right here because the Bible talks about the sons of Issachar were effective because they were able to discern the times. And I feel looking around this table, around this, uh, this couch, this, this studio tonight, that we have some men and women that have the spirit of Issachar. And I want the world to get to know you all because we're, we're going into some tough stuff tonight. I hope y'all are ready. Can I get one amen? amen. All right, yeah, amen. So, so I want us to kind of know who's who. I know many of you have people watching and people that are watching that don't know who you are yet. Let's start right over here with my brother, Pastor Hawkins. Give us your name, where you're from, and what it is that you provide leadership to. Bless you. I am Pastor Clarence Hawkins. I'm the senior pastor of Victory Harvest Ministries uh, right here in Michigan, uh, Livonia, Michigan. I'm glad to be here tonight, Pastor. Thank awesome. You. Awesome. Teresa Thomas, Atlanta, Georgia, CEO of TFT Realty and COO of the Moore Group Enterprises. All right. Uh, Gabriel Powell, uh, pastor of the Raymond Church of Atlanta. I'm from Albany, Georgia, and I'm also a singer. Sydney Marlella Weeks, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I serve under Pastor Janine Gant Weeks at Axe Church and Apostle Thomas Wesley Weeks Sr. at New Destiny Fellowship in Wilmington, Delaware. I'm Minister Marvin Bembry Jr. I am uh, from Chicago, Illinois, and I lead the greatest group of young people uh, this side of heaven for the Illinois District Council Young People's Union of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. I'm Nathaniel Carter Jr. from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I am the CEO of This Generation Cares as well as This Generation Connects. All right. I am Carrie Turner. I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia. I am the CEO of The Girl Bible. I'm a speaker, published author, a philanthropist, and love all things that involve empowering women. I love it. Let's, let's jump over here. Yes, ma'am. Hello, everyone. I am Al Lewis from Lakeland, Florida, and I am an attorney for our government. Yes, sir. Hey, I'm Elder Marcus Battle from Greensboro, North Carolina, New Jerusalem Cathedral, also CEO of Text, a private content platform. Uh, I'm Eugene Partridge from Cincinnati, Ohio, a Greater Manual Apostolic Temple. Uh, I'm a corporate business leader, uh, also an author uh, a book, of a book called Career Fertilizer, music producer, TEDx speaker, whole nine. Hi, I'm Pastor Kadisha Jenkins. I am the co-pastor of New Beginnings Outreach Ministries International in Columbia, South Carolina. I am the author of I Am She and the CEO of She Movement. Awesome. Pastor? Um, my name is James Tyson. I am the husband of one wife. Uh, and father of two children. You better get the plug uh, in, Doc. Get, get the plug in on Nash, international uh, television. Uh, I'm the executive pastor of Christchurch Apostolic in Indianapolis, Indiana, as well as um, an author and the, uh, the leader and the, uh, the host of the Back at One conference. Awesome. Hi, my name is uh, Chris Williams. I'm the husband of no wife. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, just recently became uh, one, of the, uh, one of the youngest black uh, subway owners in the city of Atlanta, uh, literally a little over a year after being homeless. Wow. Wow. I'm Marcus Y. Rozier. I am the lead pastor of the Epic Nation in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and CEO of Win the Day Group, and an author of 23 books. Wow. Wow. So as you all can tell in the room, we have some amazing gifts sitting here in conversation. Before the night, some of them asked the cameraman to get a shot of Gene's shoes, but we'll deal with that later. Everybody's not able, just, you know, you need to buy his book just because of the shoes, but we'll talk about that another time. I want us to jump into the conversation because tonight, we're really gonna kind of navigate through three areas as it pertains to the role and the function of the church. Uh, we all know, all of us, even though we have a diverse set of experience from ministry, media, and the marketplace represented on the stage tonight, all of us, I know, have a heart and a love for the church. Am I right? All of us recognize that no matter how imperfect she could be in moments, she is still the bride of Christ. And Jesus loved it enough to die for it. Surely we ought to love it enough to fight for it. But I want us to kind of, let's, let's start here. It's tragic, it's unfortunate, but we would not be young leaders at all if we did not address where society was in this moment. I talked about the sons of Issachar discerning the times, and I know just from personal conversations with you all that all of us are heartbroken, we're angry, we're grieving. 
we're devastated by the state of affairs in this nation right now as it pertains specifically this week to the, to, to the mass shootings that have taken place. The unfortunate thing, and I'm, I'm thinking as I'm talking, even though we're live now, if they aired this months from now, the unfortunate reality is that we could still be talking about mass shootings and it would still be relevant to the week that surrounds the airing. We have to have a foot in the political realm if we're gonna be leaders, am I right? Do we agree with that? Um, we, we always see these shootings and God knows our prayers go out to those in El Paso. Our prayers go out really just, I believe, two weeks ago to those in California, uh, certainly to those in Dayton, Ohio, that were affected by the most recent shootings. But oftentimes when this happens, I'm just laying a foundation for our, con our conversation. Many times the response is that, well, we're, we're sitting our thoughts and our prayers. And I dare not sit here as a man of faith and minimize the effectiveness of prayer. But I do think that at some point we must also emphasize the need of pairing policy with our prayer. And that cannot happen if we do not have some conversation around the role of politics in our faith. And so I wanna just kind of jump out there with that question. I wanna ask you all, and again, you all know we're having conversation, we're free, we're open. Um, I want us to be open and transparent, transparent and honest. Let me ask you, in your mind, in your opinion, does the church have a role to play in politics? Does the church have a responsibility to have a political element? I wanna throw that out there. Who wants to take advantage of that question first? Who wants to jump on that? Because I really think that that's something that we could, we could really, really go with. My sister here, I, I, think, I think Al has something she wants to say. She said she's an attorney for the government. She's doing incredible work there in Lakeland. Let me start with you and then we'll let that volleyball just kind of go back and forth. Does the church have a role to play in politics? Absolutely, the church has a role to play in when it deals with politics. Yes, um, the church does have a role to play when it deals with politics for two reasons. Number one, it's because we're dis and I'm gonna just go ahead and cut the chase. We're disproportionately represented when it comes to the judicial system. Right. And when you're not equally represented on the tables, you have an issue. Your voice will not be heard for your people. And and when it relates to the church, because we do bring that conservative peace to the world to the world. And so that's why it's also imperative for us of faith and us who do believe in in God and believing in bringing that peace for us to speak on those political issues to bring that peace to the world and have that voice for the people. And I also think that it starts within the community. From the beginning, it's church versus state, which is a negative. It needs to be church and state. Yes, we have presidents. Yes, we have senators. Yes, we have mayors. But it starts with the city councilmen in our communities. At the end of the day, we need to come together as a church and start making those connections because we could have people in our churches having internships with the city councilmen that puts them in office to become those mayors, senators, and then presidents. I like that. I want to hear from somebody else. We, we, what I'm hearing my sister say is that we definitely have a responsibility to have an element and an arm in politics and a voice at the table. But I guess the question then becomes, all right, if we're involved, to what degree, to what extent? Is there a historical precedent even for church and activism and social justice? And Chris, you look like you want to say something. Yes, sir. So um, as we were talking um, earlier, I kind of explained, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, many um, successful men and women um, who are uh, great multimillionaires. And one of the things that they do extremely well is they put their money um, where their mouth is as it pertains to politics. So um, for us, um, we've seen uh, from the 60s uh, on to now, we protest and we march with signs and stuff. And I think that's amazing. But um, a lot of the laws that are passed are passed because corporations send lobbyists and they send their money up to uh, D.C. to uh, lobby for certain laws. Uh, one of the things that we have done um, or we haven't done is transition and evolve to the place where we can send our money. I um, mean, I think we do that by um, training and raising up entrepreneurs who can um, be able to have the godly mindset, but who can also um, represent the, the church by sending their money, um, as well as the church itself, um, the entity, um, uh, the, the, the local entities doing that to lobby for certain laws. 
Carrie, Car Car go ahead. Sure, I was just gonna say the fact of the matter is this. Every person that attends a church in a community is a part of a local municipality. Right. They pay taxes in some sort of way. Right. They have to be involved in the process. Church has to become more than just a place for politicians to come right. on Sunday morning when they are preparing to run for office. Right. It has to be an ongoing conversation where there are regular resources, regular connections that flow in and out of the church. Because the church has always been historically a very powerful place. You talked about the 60s, and we can go back to King and so many others who in many ways were considered politicians in their own pulpits because they led huge movements. And so, yes, the church has a huge role, but I think the church has to decide what role it wants to play and then begin to lead the conversation that way. I love it. I love it. Marvin, go ahead. To continue even off of that, the church in the historical view, if you look at Dr. King and what he advocated for, there were those at that point in time who said the church shouldn't have a place in this because it's a heart issue. It's a, it's a matter of the heart and we have to change the heart through God. Well, Dr. King also said this, and I'm paraphrasing. He said that uh, while legislation cannot make a man hate me, it can stop him from lynching me. And so mm -hmm. I think the church must wow. advocate for specific policy positions. If we believe that there is a stance, a God-authored stance on something, if we believe that uh, that we should advocate for gun control or we should advocate for immigration reform, then we must be able to stand on that and say, this is what God says and this is what we believe and we're willing to advocate for that. Wow. I, I would say, to add to the conversation, I think belief determines behavior. So we don't have a belief and see ourselves properly. We don't see ourselves as both king and priest. If we did, then we would realize that there is no Bible, even before Dr. King, that is not involved with political order. You know, Joseph, he didn't get paid for interpreting dreams, but he got paid for handling the gross national product. So I think what we do in terms of giving of our service and giving of our gifts to be able to create economic reform and social reform, that's what we have all throughout scripture, whether it be John the Baptist, we can go on and on and on with examples. So we have to see ourselves as both, not just a priest, but also a king. Marcus, you, you, you make me think about something, and that's, if we want to be honest from a biblical perspective, the office of the prophet had nothing to do with, with chariots and castles and, and new garments. It had everything to do with speaking truth to power. And the king would get nervous when the priest, would, when the prophet would show up, wait, hold on, are you here in peace? Or what's, what's the, before we let you in, what, what did the Lord tell you? Because we have always been expected to have the ability to speak truth to governments, uh, whether the government happens to be Pharaoh or Caesar, uh, God has all, or 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 the president, whoever, whatever government it is, the prophetic voice always has a role. Now, let me let me shift for a second and and, and let's go deeper for a moment. We've established and we seem to be in consensus that the role of the church is required. We have to have a hand in politics. Here's the question, and I think that this is a line that has to be drawn in the sand. Is it possible to legislate morality? Because especially, y'all know it's, it's election season now, and I hate to say it, but we're being honest, it's nobody here but us and 80 million homes around the world, but just us for now, all right? Every time we reach an election cycle, there are certain buzzwords that come into the conversation to get the church upset or aligned with a particular party or candidate. And the, the, the truth of the matter, we wanna be honest, don't nobody say nothing about those, those buzzwords as soon as the election is over until it's time for another cycle. And it almost is, it's almost as if it's, it's dangling a carrot in front of church people because we know y'all care about this. So we'll talk about it now. We won't say nothing or do anything about it if we get in office, but we gotta talk about it. Is it possible to legislate morality? I wanna hear from y'all, what do y'all think? Can we, can, we, can, we, can we become that righteous nation if we just get the right man of God in office? The right I, I woman of God? Like, Mark, I feel like we can, uh, but I feel like the reason that we don't is because uh, the church specifically, um, we, we, we hear that scripture all the time about, you know, occupy until he comes, right? right. But I feel like a lot of us have gotten lazy uh, in, in the standards that we put forth outside of the church. We'll talk about it inside the church, but we don't want to talk about it outside the church. We don't realize how powerful we are as an entity. And I, I just personally believe that if we would really stand, make a stand, come together uh, between our churches and stand up for certain standards, that we could move the political conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I happen to be
be an individual that enjoys politics. I, I watch it. I watch the rules. I watch the laws. I watch how the process works because I would love to have influence on that. I feel like a lot of us feel like Jesus is coming so soon that we don't have to do anything right now right. to push a moral standard into law. So I think it's possible, but it takes us coming together in unity to be able to push a moral issue. I want to hear, I want to hear from someone else. Can we legislate morality? That's a, a, a valuable perspective, but let me hear from someone else because some of y'all got that, that look like I want to say it, but I don't know. The Lord release you right now. Be so free in Jesus' name. I ahead, think see. that um, just as Pastor was saying that it's a, it's a lack of knowledge that, yes, we might watch it, but we don't process it and, you know, spit it back out to our community, to our church. And I think that there's not a lot of outlets in the church to talk about politics because it's such a taboo topic. I think that when we have the knowledge, when we don't become ignorant, because ignorance is the lack of knowledge, and we know which side, because most of the time with politics, we vote for who our house is, we vote for who our friends like we vote you know on influence but we don't have a full solid source to make a decision so something like YLC this year we have the candidates coming and we are having the knowledge from all of the candidates with no pressure to make a sound decision now what is this YLC you speak of this sounds <laughs> is this something I can register for but, no. <laughs> but but in all seriousness you know I, I do want to make that I'm glad you mentioned that not knowing you would say that but I'm glad you did because we do have five presidential candidates coming to the conference. And I want to be clear, because y'all know, whenever you put any announcement out, y'all have done enough, built enough to know, there will always be two sides. One side is cheering from the rafters. The other side is, what can I find to say negative about this? You know, you could walk on water and somebody would say, it's only because he can't swim, you know, so you can't please everybody. But we are not a political group we are not, we don't endorse any candidate. We are bipartisan. These are the candidates that want to come. And we felt that it was necessary because again, you cannot impact a system you don't understand. Yeah. And so I think that creating a platform for conversation to take place is necessary because y'all know I'm not trying to be negative. Y'all know my heart. Y'all know how I love the church, but we can shout and dance all night. But if you do not vote when you get done dancing, I don't care. I'm not telling you who to vote for, but vote. Be informed of the decisions and the issues that matter to you. Marvin, you were going to say something, I believe. I think the church has an opportunity to influence the morality of the country. Um, the church has the ability to say this is what God says, and we have to exert that in the marketplace, exert that in our policy, exert that on culture as a whole. But to think that um, our ideals are going to be adopted by people who aren't saved, I think it's, it's somewhat... Uh, foolhardy because mm. we have our job is to be the church and if we are the church then we can win folk and then we can influence greater culture but I don't think we have the ability to just make culture accept what God says if they're not going to live right. So you're saying that we're almost in one sense we're operating with unrealistic expectations if we expect the world to stop being the world and be the church I, I think that that's a good point because sometimes it's almost as if we feel that we can march and protest away scripture. You cannot outmarch what has already been prophesied in the word of God. I don't care who's in the office. I don't care who's in the White House. At, at a certain point, we got to remember that tribulation is coming. Yeah. Bishop Jakes could be the president. I could be the secretary of state. Uh, Joel Osteen could be the vice president. And the world is still the world. They still We'll there will still be those that reject Jesus. So I think that we have to just make up our mind that we're going to be us. And the darker the world gets, the brighter the church is going to shine. But at the same time, we have to find a way to still occupy until he comes. To use what Gene said and make sure that we have a hand in maintaining and operating in the systems that are in place until I want to be caught up to see him. I do want to be caught up to see him. But until he catch me up, if I can say it that way. I still got to drive my car down these streets. I got to buy land in these cities. So I think that we, we, if we're going to be relevant as leaders, we have to have a hand in the land that we live in. Amen. Is that what we're saying? Yes. Listen, I love it. Let, let's, let's do something different here. We want to go and, and take a break. We're going to go to commercial real quick. Let's look at a scene from the 2018 Young Leaders Conference. If you're watching at home, you're enjoying the conversation, I need you quickly go to Facebook and share 
the stream. Go to Facebook and tell them to join us in the conversation. Put your prayer requests, put your questions, put the things you want to know in there. And while you're doing that, let's go to this scene from YLC 2018. Let's have church for a few minutes and we'll be back momentarily. God bless you. We'll see you real soon. Share, 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 share.
Listen, down through the years, God has been good to me. Is that anybody's testimony watching? If so, I hope you'll go ahead and share this conversation with your timeline so that they can be involved in this necessary discourse. Listen, that was a moment in time that I'll never forget because that was Friday night, 369 days ago now. Friday night service at the Young Leaders Conference 2018, God met us in a special way. Miracles, signs, wonders, people getting out of wheelchairs. And I'm most excited, not just about what God did, but what I have a feeling he's getting ready to do next week in Atlanta. If you have not registered, over 5,000 people have made the choice to invest in their future and join this community of influencers, leaders, thinkers, creatives, preachers, singles, entrepreneurs, women in ministry, all seeking not to compete, but to collaborate. Go now to exploreylc.com and register for what we're believing will be the conference of the year. Everybody from presidential candidate, Senator Cory Booker and Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren to world-renowned preachers like Dr. Jamal Bryan and Bishop Noel Jones to industry experts, Warren Campbell and Kev on stage, everybody is gonna be there except for you. But you can fix that now, go register. Now let's go back into the conversation while I'm speaking prophetically, while they are registered. Can I get some prophetic strings from the minstrels? I need, so you know, and put me in E flat. That's my prophetic key. Uh, that's the, I feel a win, I feel a win. No, but, but we're having a good time, y'all. Let's jump into this. We talked a little bit about, thank you, I'm done with the prophecy. You gotta flow with me. You gotta flow with me. You're not tapped in. You're not, no, I'm just playing. Listen, I, I want us to talk a little bit about the church in culture, right? We've talked about politics. We've talked about our responsibility and our role and our function. But let's talk about the church as it pertains to culture, all right? And I want to start here. I don't know who's going to take it first, but I do want to start here. We hear all the time in our generation specifically that, you know, the church is no longer relevant. And relevant is a major buzzword as it pertains particularly to the, to the black church. Um, is it relevant anymore? Do people still want to come? You hear so many people, uh, so many Facebook theologians, uh, so many Instagram intellectuals that have this idea, right? Never see no research. I'll never see no numbers. I'll never see no stats, but they have this very strong conviction that the millennials and everybody under 40 just hates church. We don't want nothing to do. We don't want to go. We don't want no church music. We don't want nothing. Churches, I'm tired of this church. That little boy was tired of that church that day. He, he, meant, he, he meant that from the depths of his soul, Reverend. But I don't think that's everybody's testimony. I want to hear, I want to hear from y'all. What do we say to the conversation about relevancy in the church? Go I'll ahead, jump in on that. Um, I think that when we discuss relevancy, we must first be careful not to make broad generalizations right. about the church at large. Right. So when we talk about it more on a local level, I think Jesus made the pathway clear that after the Holy Ghost comes upon us, he'll make us witnesses to distinctive audiences. And if we don't take the time to understand what those audiences are, then we locally and collectively do become irrelevant to whatever audience that God has called us to. Mm. Wow. Awesome. Uh, and to, to go off of that, I also believe um, we have to identify what we are being relevant to. Are we attempting to be relevant to people or are we attempting to be relevant to the gospel? And so many of us in many churches and um, just the world wants us to be relevant to their, um, to their preferences. And um, we're not here to be relevant to a preference, um, but as a whole, we're here to be relevant to the gospel. I think from a biblical standpoint, you know, he told them he'll build his church, but told them to wait until they're endowed with power. But I, I believe we have an incomplete Pentecost mm. because we, I used to believe that Pentecost happened with the 120, but it was not complete until what happened in the 120 hit the streets. And they mm. said, how is it that we hear God preached in our language? Mm -hmm. And I think the language that we're using only fits church. We don't say any of those things at our workplace so we can't influence culture. And you cannot have a conversation with people when we say we'll change the world. You can't change a world you don't understand or engage with. Mm -hmm. So I think the conversation has to shift to find relevant language because every nation has a language. But what language do we speak to those that we interact with, not just those we tap our neighbor with in church? Mm -hmm. And Pastor, I, uh, I want to add to that. Uh, one, of the things, one of the things I try my best to keep in mind that it is okay for the method to change as long as the message 
does not change. The message of Jesus Christ, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with the gospel. We don't have to adjust the gospel, but we may have to adjust how we do ministry, how we engage. For example, I, I use this example all the time. Uh, door to door, uh, the average person going door to door, uh, somebody's going to look out that peephole and not answer that door. Right. But I, I Did you call you, first? Did you, right, did you call right. first? Yeah. If you didn't call, you know, I'm not going to open the door. Uh-huh. But I can put a status on my Facebook and reach uh, triple the amount of people right. that I would have reached mm-hmm. if I went door to door. Mark, I would say that one thing that we miss uh, is that relevance should always be needs based. Oh, that's good. Um, if you're not if you're not meeting a need, you're not relevant. Uh, we hear a lot of times that millennials don't want to go to church; they're not involved. Uh, they're going to church; they're just not going to your church. Uh, they're going where their needs are being met. So, if we look at relevance from the perspective of meeting a need, will always be relevant because needs change in culture. I just put a post up the other day that Instagram didn't exist ten years ago. Right. Uh, uh, 15 years ago, uh, uh, cell phones were different. Right. Right. Needs change over time. And and as needs change, we should change as well. And that's how we remain relevant. Wow. Yeah. I want to add that, you know, needs change, just as you said, based upon context as well. And the type of context that might take place in terms of a church in the Midwest might be different than the South. The problem is we want to make the church look all the same. We want to operate completely the same. And we're not operating based off of community and what's needed. We're trying to fit it in this particular box. And that doesn't necessarily work. It is possible to keep the message the same, but to use a different method by which we're me- we- uh, reaching people, sorry, reaching people mm-hmm. throughout the world, and that's how we stay relevant. Wow. And, and, just because, ahead, and just because it's relevant, that doesn't make it right. Yeah. And okay. just because it's not relevant, that doesn't mean that it's not wrong. Uh, like, for example, like, like our white evangelicals here who's failing to embrace what is right, but yet they call themselves the church. Right. And so what is happening is there was a time when the church was for the people. There was a place where our people were safe. Mm -hmm. Now we have entered a culture of abnormality where some people are afraid to go to church. You know what I mean? But again, that doesn't say that is wrong. It's just as you were saying, ma'am, it's the context of it. It's the context in which we're executing in the time because the church moves with the time. And the church has stopped moving with the time, which is why it lacks relevance in this segment. And I also think that with relevance, we sometimes make it more broader than it is. We sometimes make it seem like we have to do something big all of the time. But sometimes it's just planting one seed that will forever trickle the domino for generations to come. Moses never made it to the promised land, but his legacy made it. Ooh. He freed the people. Wow. But at you the end of the day, he, strings again. <laughs> all right now, woman of God. He come never on. made it to the end. So you don't have to do something big every single day. Sometimes it's just a small see that you plant that will harvest for generations to come. Could, could, I, could I interject yeah. and suggest then, are we saying that relevance depends on purpose? Very much so. so. Meaning, yeah. for example, Very. in some settings, the church's relevance hinges on its consistency in what it's been designed to do since Jesus walked the earth. Right. Yeah. I, Go ahead. Yeah, I believe that we uh, become so critical of one another in the body of Christ so much based off of what programs we do or we don't have. And to the point that you just kind of underlined, if I'm not in the inner city, then I may not need an after hours rec league for right. my ministry. Right. That might and not be relevant for you. It's right. not relevant. So gotcha. it's very subjective and divine socially, locally, and collectively. And even individually, I believe we are distracted by what we see everybody else doing until we've deemed it within ourselves that we don't have any purpose, we have no voice, we have nothing to state, and God is still echoing on our heart waiting for the sons and daughters of God to manifest because the world is screaming, we need somebody who will stand up and say what it is that needs to be said. Pastor Mark, can I add to that? Please, there, please. I think there is a, a huge distinction between I think we have blurred the line somewhere between relevance and distinction. Okay. Um, if you want to talk about statistical data, um, the Barna Group put out that the culture changes every four years, yes, sir. Uh, but the church changes every 20 years, mm-hmm. which means the church is five times behind yes, sir. Um, the cultural changes that are going on around us. Yeah. Um, so I think even even from, from the standpoint of, 
us saying that we're trying to reach millennials. The truth is, if, if we actually are trying to master meeting millennials, by the time we actually master it, my kids will be my right. age, <laughs> and we would have missed that entire can we Can we just address the fact that typically in church, we consider everything under 50 millennial. Can oh, yeah. we, can somebody yeah. please put an end to the what a millennial, if you were born between 80 this and 90 whatever, if you weren't in that window, you're not a millennial. I think that tagging on what you said, and y'all tell me what y'all think about this. I think that it's also important for the conversation that we remember that in this whole thing about relevance, one of the biggest insults we pay millennials or young people in general is we present us as if we all think one way. Right. Yeah. We all like one style of music. Yeah. We all just want vanilla, chocolate, or strawberry. There are no 31 flavors for us. Why is it that in the church, now outside of the church, Corporate America sales, you business owners can testify, you all understand, we understand in that context, the diversity of our demographic, but why is it in church we have young people like this and old people like this? Could it be that we're missing entire pockets of the population sure. because we fail to recognize the diversity even within our demographic? Sure. Everybody born in 88 is not the same as me. Every preacher in his 30s is not the same as me. There are some preachers, you know, even, even represented in our stage, and I want to give it back to you guys. Some of us, our Easter outfit is some nice jeans and Jordans. Right. Marcus, I'm looking at you. Huh? <laughs> huh? But then others of us, you know, forget Easter, I'm wearing a three-piece suit. Some of y'all wearing a three-piece suit. Gene, I'm looking at you, but I'm looking over here. Three-piece suit, because it's Bible study. And th this is, it's not a heaven or hell issue. It's not this one's right or wrong. It's this is my personal preference. And I think that we've dismissed all of that, and then we define relevant based on a flawed metric. Does that make sense? Yes. What, 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 else, what else are we saying about this? Because it, it just grieves me when so many people are so adamant that the church is not relevant, and oftentimes their argument is just because, well, it's old. Well, the Bible is old. Right. God is old. Right. Right. I'm talking about Alpha and Omega, before the beginning was, he am. It, what, what are we saying here? What else do we need to say about this relevant piece? What are your thoughts on this? There's a failure to appreciate diversity mm -hmm. and a failure to appreciate distinction. Um, like you said, everybody, everybody in my culture, everybody in my age bracket is not going to be the same. Right. And because we have tried to lump everybody in one box, mm -hmm. we have said if somebody uh, veers outside of this box, it's automatically compromised instead of saying, no, they are diverse. And if anything in God is going to be effective, it's got to be diverse. You see that all the way from the beginning. He didn't make the trees the same color as the ocean. Right. So everything, everything is in, in him is diverse. So once we can really appreciate that, I think we'll be more effective um, as a church as a whole. Wow. I think on that, Pastor Tyson, I think it's easy to group what you don't want to understand. Yeah. So uh, when, you don't, that, when you don't have a conversation to really understand the different sides, and I'm saying that for both millennials, for Gen Xers, for baby boomers, one thing, and I, I see a lot of things from a business perspective because I spend a lot of time in boardrooms, but one thing I've learned about companies that are successful is that they purposely, they purposely seek to understand different demographics within their organization right. because they understand if they do not that their business is going to fail. For instance, right now, 75% of the workforce is millennial. Folks did not realize that overnight baby boomers are leaving they're leaving the workforce. Mm -hmm. So if they're leaving the workforce, they're leaving the church leadership, they're leaving churches as well, and the church is missing an opportunity to understand who is actually really filling up the church. So if we seek to understand, that's when we have change. I'll say this. Chris, go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Um, as it pertains to relevancy, I think um, where we have failed as a church as a whole is the fact that we focus more so on being relevant than being effective. And I feel like when you are, um, and the woman of God kind of spoke on it earlier um, in comparison to the ambition and the purpose, mm -hmm. when you are focused on your purpose and you're focused on your assignment as to what we are supposed to do, not necessarily um, uh, limited to a certain way or method, but being open to um, the culture or the society that we are in, when you do that, uh, relevancy will never be a problem. If you look at the life of Jesus, crowds followed him because he was effective, not right. because he was trying to be relevant. And I think just to add to that, it's some people look at it relevance of popularity. And so I think it's an overused buzzword mm. because you really speak to your audience where you are. The Bible says he who wins souls is wow. 
wise. Amen. So we have to look at where our church is and what is relevant for a huge mass church isn't going to be the same in my neighborhood. Right. Statistically, in the United States, the average church is 75 members. Yeah. So I, if I'm not, you know, I don't have 10,000 members, oh, your church isn't relevant. Yes, I am. I'm touching the community where I am. Yeah. So I think we have to get away from I'm trying to be relevant in comparison to another church, That's and good. I'm meeting the needs of my community. Can't jump on that. The heart does not ask the lungs whether or not it's relevant. <laughs> the feet didn't ask the arms whether or not That's it's good. relevant. The too. point is they all have a role to play. Every piece in the body has a function and a role to play. The problem is when we decide we don't want to be the heart anymore right. and we want to be the eyes right. because the eyes are more relevant and the eyes are more important. We right. know that that's not the case. I think it boils down to respect. When we begin to respect the role that God has assigned us, the purpose that God that's has good. given us for our particular area in our particular communities, we would not compare. We would not conform. Yeah. Do you hear me? We would do the, the thing that we have been assigned to do. And so I think that that is what it's about, understanding our role and how to do that at our best. I think a, wow. great, I think a great example that, that the church could model is that of Blockbuster and, Red, and then Redbox. Mm. Because it's the same process except Redbox pops up at a time the gas prices are up. And they eliminate the idea of having to pay for real estate or employees. Now you can go to a place you're already going and grab a movie. It's not that people stop watching movies. They just didn't want to pay membership fees and late fees for, for five-day movie rentals. So it's packaging the exact same thing but in a different way. And some might say it's wrong to make it convenient, but I don't think it is. I think that's what streaming has done. Right. It has just made something convenient. And, and one more statement you were, we were mentioning about diversity. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. I think the sign of God's promise is the rainbow. People stop for miles and stare at it, but then look down and turn up their nose at diversity. So it doesn't make sense to marvel at the combinations of colors in the air as a rainbow, but then anything that looks different, we have a problem with. And, and I would say to that, uh, I think there's a fear around diversity because now if you have cultures that are collaborating together, one perhaps is drowning out the other. Yeah. Right. And so that's why there's always this separation between there where um, how can you um, occupy the same space and they don't know my story or they don't know who it is that I am or what it is that I bring to the table. And so that is a fear not only for people but also for churches where we say that we, uh, we, we want to shift the culture but oftentimes those situations turn into monoculture right. where it's the same, where it's a color and you are now embracing what they do. And yeah. so I think there's that fear of getting, getting over what that looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow, I love it. Let, yeah, we, let me ask you this. Marcus, go ahead. Close us out there. I was just going to say we can't stay inflexible. I believe that God sends us the people who are assigned to us so many times. And because they don't come in the package that we, the condemnation kind of rests upon us when we are inflexible, which is kind of the opposite of what I'm hearing of being relevant tonight, um, to meet people where they are. For instance, if God sends you the unchurched, we love to say, oh, I attract the unchurched. But if God sends them, you're ready to tell them to lift their hands without explaining the reason for it. That's good. Yeah, yeah. And so when they don't do it, then you assume that you're relevant and Christ is still the same, right. but you just needed to take the time to explain why we actually have to lift our hands. Or if we're going to speak in tongues today, you need to have a Bible study, carve those things out to be flexible, to make sure that whomever God is sending to become your audience, to reach that God is anointing you with the proper tools because you're humble enough to submit to the people who are there. You know, a lot, of, a lot of times, and I think you all will agree because you all are leaders in respective fields, a lot of times, if we'd be honest, many of us don't want to admit that the thing we've been praying for, if we got it, it would destroy us. Right. Yeah, that's good. Let's be honest. There are a lot of, and certainly never anybody that knows YLC knows what we're trying to do. We, don't, we, we embrace all generations, all, all different kind of people, all different schools of thought. So I'm not at all being negative about this, but a lot of times you see older churches and they talk about, we want, we want, to, re we want to reach the, the young folk. No, you don't. Right. No, no, you don't. No, you don't. Because when, when, when the young folk come in with their hats on or holes in their jeans or, or, or what, whatever the young folk in your context do, a lot of times we're not prepared for that. 
it's not that we don't love them or it's not, it's not you know, none of that, but we're not prepared for it. And more importantly, we don't have a framework to minister to it because we don't understand it. Right. So maybe we would be better off if we asked God, Lord, put me in my place and give me my people. Yeah. Yeah. Could it be that oftentimes in our black church context, we sometimes we bury our pastors way too young yeah. because we give them this Superman complex that you got to be all things to all men yeah. and you better win all of them. That's not what Paul said. Yeah. Right. He said, I become all things all, that I might win some. I recognize I ain't going to get everybody. Right. And a lot of us, we deem ourselves as failures yeah. if we don't have everybody. Right. You aren't built for everybody. Right. My conference ain't for everybody. Yeah. Right. Your church ain't for everybody. Your business, your product, your book, your service might not be for everybody. So I think we have to embrace that. But I want to shift this here before we go to the next segment here. We have a lot of diversity on the stage, even in our interest and in our um, Exposure. I want to spend a few minutes here. We'll pick it up again in a moment. But there are some that make the argument that we as a church, we were more powerful before we got as successful. There are some people that long for the good old days, you know, and, and you hear it. And it's often always said with a sense of reverence, you know, back before we had all of these buildings and back before we had this, we had our washboards and our tambourines. And, you know, we thought the glory was was in there, but we were just stomping and dust was coming up, you know. Well, OK. Some, that, amen. God bless you. But there are some that suggest that we had more glory. We had more power. Let me ask you, all were we more powerful before we got money? Chris, I feel like um, this and I, I want to word it correctly. Mm -hmm. um, talked about how the old saints used to talk about um, the old, good old days and I think it's amazing because we are all here because of the good old days mm -hmm. however um, God anointed Moses to um, deliver the people of Israel out of the good old days to take them into um, the place of, of milk and honey which he had promised them and I think it's a thing of responsibility so whenever God gives you to whom much is quiet uh, to whom much is given much is required so yes, if God gives us more then we're required to address that so I don't think it's a thing of um, we were more powerful then. I think it was a thing of we were more responsible because we had smaller, but now it's time for us to match our responsibility or to uh, it's time for us to meet that responsibility level um, that uh, we have been given, basically. Okay. I would, I would say ahead, this. We, we weren't, uh, we didn't have more glory then. We just didn't have as much money. We was broke. <laughs> um, and if, if we're going to tell the truth, um, having more things does not stop us from seeking after the glory of God. Having a degree does not stop you from fasting and praying. That is what brought the glory, not the fact that people didn't have no money. And really, that shaped a whole generation's ideology about who God is. That shaped, I can only ask God for my rent. I can only ask God for my lights bills to be paid. And they miss the fact that you can actually ask God for the business so then you can pay multiple people's light bills. You can ask God to bless you in every endeavor that you go after so that you are no longer, right, the borrower, but now you are the lender. And so when we, when we package this and say they had it all back then, we miss that God's trying to do a new thing right now. Right. I think, I think Go with, this, with this particular uh, question here, it all boils down to one thing, and that's purpose. Money or no money. There are a lot of business owners that are sitting on this stage right now. And once you deviate from your purpose, the business begins to look, you have changed the narrative of your business. And so if we, if, if we get back to why we have church and the point of the church and what the church is supposed to do in their community, like ma'am was saying over there, then it wouldn't matter if you had money or no money because you are fulfilling the purpose of God in, in which you started your church for. So that's my mm -hmm. opinion. Mm -hmm. Pastor. Yes, sir. Um, I kind of want to just kind of flip it, flip the coin. You got that bit. flip the coin face on. <laughs> yeah. I had a feeling that he was going to flip the coin. Down. <laughs> so, so, so Paul says, I know how to be a base and I know how to be a bow. Right. Um, one of the things that I am discovering as a pastor mm -hmm. is that um, the more money and the more success we, we get, we receive, people have a hard time learning how to live without. Mm -hmm. um, 
And what I mean is at the, at the end of the day, at the end of your success and at the end of your, um, your, your education, at some point, you're going to have to know how to depend on Jesus Christ. And so a lot of times what we see is we see the, the pursuit of purpose. Uh, but I wanted, to, I wanted to kind of add one, one thing to it. Um, or you can teach people your purpose in Jesus Christ so that when, when all of these things run out, and things do run out, people go through divorces, people lose houses, people lose the job that you prayed for, mm -hmm. life is going to hit you, and you're going to have to rely on Jesus Christ, your relationship with Jesus Christ. So as we are teaching people to empower themselves, and as we are teaching people to pursue education, I believe in that. Right. I also want to make sure I preach a, a, a greater message that you need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So here it is, here it is, here it is. It's nothing wrong with these things. What you're saying is, and I think we all would agree, seek ye first the kingdom his righteousness, then nothing wrong with the things. Sometimes we demonize the things. Nothing wrong with the things, but let's put the things in the right order. Is that what we're saying? I want to pick this back up because I, I, I want to want to add something else to make it make it interesting because I think I think that on the power question, we have primarily one generation represented here. So there's a generation that knew not <laughs> Pharaoh, right? Or knew not knew not Joseph. So so I want to come back to that. But let's do this. We need a, we need a break. We need we need to shout a little bit. Let's go back to a moment from YLC 2018. You've been watching. You've been attentive. Thank you so much. I see the numbers are going crazy. Somebody decided to share. If you haven't join in. Go ahead and share the Facebook stream right here on the Word Network's Facebook page. Tell a neighbor, tell a friend to tune in. But until we come back, let's go back and see a little bit of the praise from YLC 2018 and we'll be back in just a few minutes. This time, sit down, sit down. We gotta move expeditiously. We gotta move expeditiously. Y'all sit down. The people behind you can't see. Sit down, sit down. But I'm saying this to say, listen, 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 listen. We gotta go live. We gotta go live. Well, listen, I gotta. <laughs> Television is waiting on us, y'all. I gotta take care of kingdom business. But just one more time, look at somebody and say, neighbor, when I think of the goodness of Jesus, I'm not even going to finish it. You finish it. I ain't got to say nothing else. When I think of the goodness. You can look at me if you want to, but my hands go up my my mouth swings open, my feet get happy. Cause I've got a reason. All right, for real, Chris, for real. God bless you. Y'all sit down. Y'all sit down. Sit down for real. Let me let me do what we came to do. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Some of y'all was dry a minute ago. Go back to being dry. Just that some of us been through too much hell to get here, to get here and look cute. Didn't, didn't, didn't come all this way. Y'all sit down. Didn't come all this way to go through form, but we honor the Lord tonight. Don't do nothing else. Don't do nothing else. I got to get through here. Jabari, for real. Don't do that. Don't. All right, this is the deal. This is the deal. This is the deal. This is the deal. I'm going to give y'all 90 good seconds. Listen, we're going to praise God a lot tonight. But look at your neighbor today. But this praise is for everything that happened this year that did not work. You got 87 more seconds. Go, 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 go.
Let's just sit down, sit down, sit down. Listen, I need you to help me. I need you to help me. Sit down, sit down. Hold on, Glenn. We're going to get there. 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 Hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Y'all sit down. Y'all sit down. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen. Wow, wow, wow. If you were watching at home and you were still sitting on your couch, you're watching at work, you're still sitting in your cubicle, please, I, I don't want you to have to hold this in. Get up and go to the bathroom if you need to and just shout at work in the bathroom. <laughs> you at home, wake the kids. I know the kids got school in the morning, but they're not asleep yet. Go ahead and just take a praise break at the house because this is the kind of glory, the kind of power that just seven days from now, we are gonna be experiencing. What you saw last year, that clip, that was Young Leaders Conference with 3,000 people. We have found 2,000 brand new friends to come join us this year to shout and to praise God. 40, I, we did the numbers the other day, 40 plus denominations, everyone from Full Gospel Baptist, National Baptist, Progressive Baptist. We have Catholic people coming. We have AME, Zion, AME. We have PCAF, Bible Way, PAW, Cool JC. Everybody's gonna be there but you unless you go register. Let's do that now. Remember, tell somebody that we're on. I want us to jump right back to where we were because it was getting good. It was getting real good. We were talking about just the relevancy of the church and you know, in culture. And, and one of the things that we hear a lot is the fact that you know, the church used to have more power and then we got successful and we lost our power. We, we've heard multiple perspectives and I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of the man in the middle here, just kind of hearing and, and, and listening and staring. We've heard one perspective, but I think that another point that has to be made and then I'm, I'm gonna jump to Pastor Kadisha Jenkins and then I wanna hear from Pastor Hogg because I think you all were gonna tag it at the end. We'll spend a few minutes here then I wanna introduce another thought. But what do you say to the argument that says, well, how can we determine how much power we have compared to a generation right. that we have not encountered? Yeah. Because I'm blessed, I'm sitting next to Pastor Tyson here. Our, we, we were friends before we were born, right? right? right. My, my father and his father, the Honorable Bishop C. Sean Tyson, literally grew up together. In fact, a little history nugget, the church that my grandfather pastored when I was born, I was born at Christ Temple Apostolic Worship Assembly, his grandfather pastored it before my grandfather did. And they were friends up through life. When my grandfather passed, his grandfather came over in December and swept my grandfather's driveway off. You know, we, we have history. He can tell you stories, I can tell you stories of a church that we didn't live to experience, but had testimonies of documented signs, wonders, miracles, not the occasional, you know, something good happens. I'm talking about crazy stuff on the regular. There are churches that, you, if Chicago's in the house, you can talk about Dr. Maddie Poole and, yeah. and Bishop Poole and yeah. going in and seeing crutches on the wall and, and seeing jars, am I, am I exaggerating? Jars of tumors that had come out during church. Now, here's the thing, I understand God's doing a new thing, but I, I don't think that the new thing is supposed to be the, <laughs> the, the light version. Yes. Yes. I don't think that in the last days, the new thing is supposed to be the diet power. Right, we, we've got a gluten-free Holy Ghost that, you know, we got a, we got a vegan power that, you know, you know, I'm sorry to the vegans watching, God bless you. I know you're hungry, but we love you. Uh, <laughs> I think that part of our responsibility through young leaders, through Back at One, through Life Behind the Collar, through your great count, all these things that we're doing, the churches that you lead, the businesses, part of our responsibility should be to institute a move of God in our context. Listen, that our children will talk about. Yeah. I'm sick, I'm gonna be honest, and I'm, I'm opening it up, but I gotta say this, it's on me. I'm sick and tired of hearing testimonies that are three and four decades old. Yes. Yes. You know what God used to do? How are you gonna keep telling me he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and also say, we gotta go back to black and white films to see miracles and I, 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 how do we make these two come together? Pastor, Pastor Jenkins, jump in there on this issue, then I'm going to Pastor Hawkins and then we're gonna open it up. I truly believe that one of the things that we have that's going on is a lot of people don't like to operate in their individuality. A lot of people are not looking, and when we talked about earlier about the, rev the, the relevance of the church 
if we stop looking at everybody else relevance and start looking at who we are as a people and understand that God is God by himself. And the same God then is the same God now. And voice. if we carry the same God, which is God himself, the Holy Spirit, the same things that he did back then, he'll do now through us. So when we understand who we are and what God has called us to, again, we go back to purpose and we understand our purpose and we understand who we are and stop looking looking at everybody else and the perception that everybody wants us to be and just operate in God, we then will understand that the power is still there. It's in us when we use it. I like that. I like that. Yeah, I That's all. I, I would agree uh, to Pastor's point. Um, I, I really don't think that the church has lost power. Uh, I think it's a matter of tapping by faith into some things that already exist inside of us. Jesus said the kingdom uh, it comes without observation. He also said it's within you. And so I, I believe the same, the same kingdom that brought us to this place of prosperity is the same kingdom that ushered uh, those into that place of power. But it hasn't gone anywhere. It's just, it's a prayer way. It's a, it's a fast away. It's a pushing your plate back away. And I truly believe that this generation actually possesses more power than it gets credit for. There are more miracles that take place than we actually advertise. Uh, there are more things that are happening in churches than people talk about. And so uh, we definitely get the warfare for it, uh, particularly those of us that believe it and that have pressed into that. And so I think it's just a matter of discernment and awareness and really, as our sister said, having faith in the purpose of God that is on our life. And I believe what, what they may have had is, is just the knowing that we have that same power. The, the faith in God that we have that same power. It doesn't matter how much money we have. I, 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 oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I would say this, right? Um, we, we haven't heard about miracles sometimes because we haven't broadcast them enough, but allow me to say this on the Word Network. I am cancer-free for three and a half Sir, years come on. because That's the it. same God that we Justify. used to hear about yeah. is the same God I prayed to and said, yeah. God, I need you to heal me of this cancer. God, nobody else can pray for me unless they're going to pray for cancer-free. I don't want remission. I don't want this to come back. Here's what I believe. I believe the God who healed my father of being crippled is a same God who'll heal me of this cancer. And on November 3rd, I'll be four years cancer free. Let's pause and just give God a praise for that right now. I know this ain't church, but we are who we are. We thank God for that. Sometimes we need to be reminded that he can still do it. And I think that part of the difference, Marcus, I'm coming to you. Part of the difference is, I think in one generation, I think that they operated with an understanding that all we have is God. Yes. There are parts of the world right now, even back to the whole millennials or the general, this, we don't like church. That's an American Western perspective right. that really only applies in certain contexts. Right. Revival is breaking out all over the world yes. right now. Yes. Let's, let's not play God short like he missed it when he said in the last days I pour out my spirit. He knew what he was doing yes. and the world is bigger than the United States. Right. Yeah. All right. So in that context, I think that sometimes we have to remember that as it pertains to the whole power piece, and I, I, wanna, I wanna get to you, Marcus, but it's so important that we keep in mind that he has not lost it. Yeah. He still got it. Yeah. And I think that in that generation, as, they, as it is in other parts of the world, they operate and they see miracles in Africa and parts of Asia at an unprecedented rate because they understand this is, it's God or nothing. Yeah. We don't have a degree to fall back on. Yeah. We don't have a, 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 a social system and, 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 a, and a health care plan. It, if God don't do it, yes, it's not going to be done. And I think that that level of desperation produces faith. And as blessed and resourceful as we are, I think that we have to get back to the desperation to where we say it's God or bust, so to speak. And, and when we put, I believe, that weight on him, I believe that we'll see we'll see miracles like never before. Marcus, what were you going to say, man? I think it speaks to the point of I've had one of those moments happen where you wake up with your phone dead because you thought it was plugged in. I think it's more so having available power. The Bible says we have this treasure in earth and vessels, but most of the time we don't tap into it. We don't have an internal scoreboard that allows us to know whether we're winning or losing. Yeah. So we're not plugging into ourselves and we find ourselves relinquishing our destiny, our power, our individual calling 
to the ballot box of likes and comments. Mm. Wow. And now the world gets to vote on our anointing. And if yeah. we don't get enough likes or comments, now we think we're losing, when in essence, all we have to do is plug into that treasure and we're winning. Yeah. Can, I, can I touch back on that, that power piece, though? Sure. I think, and also the miracle piece, uh, I also think that uh, in this day and time that we have uh, more or less classified what a miracle is. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, there are new miracles that are happening yeah. these days. Yeah. God is healing. Of course, he's doing that. But it's also a miracle to be able to go to church and praise God debt free. You know, in this in this age, I believe that God is calling people to be cancer free and debt free. Uh, God, God has blessed my wife and I to work with a financial coach to start that process. And I believe that as we do this, that our power, our minds when we come to church will be more free because we'll be able to do the things of God, to be focused on the things of God and not have the weight of the world on our shoulders. So I believe that in this day and time, God is actually calling us to new miracles, things we haven't seen before. We thank God for what he's done before, but I want to see new things. I want to see people getting businesses that have no business getting a business. I want to see people, I, I want to see my kids uh, starting businesses when they're young. I want to see new things. And I just think that we classify yeah. miracles and, and sometimes we're not seeing what God is doing today and we're not classifying it the same way. Yeah. That's good, that's good. Yeah. I also but think, sorry. Carrie, and then let me hear from you, Pastor Carter, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say the text says that he goes from glory to glory. Yeah. And I do my grandmother who cleaned homes for white women a disservice if I don't move from glory to glory. Not just in my prayer life, but also in how I manage money and how I move in my career. And so we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to the people who came before us yeah. to not only grow as it relates to what we're building in terms of wealth and property and those yeah. things for our families, but also a strong stronger prayer life, right. a consecrated way of living. That's All good. of those types of things are the same. That moves from glory to glory. That's good. Let's tag that, sir. Yes, sir. So I think it's necessary to go back in the business world, we would say to the mission statement. So with the resources that we are getting, we need to go always back to the mission statement to right. say these resources that we got, is it going towards what it is that we said that we are doing? And so in addition to that, we talk about these miracles that are happening and the Bible says that we will do greater works. And so we are minimizing what's greater. And as you stated, being debt free is a great work. You can do, do, <laughs> do it unto me, Lord. Right, right. I bind that Sally Mae demon <laughs> right now. Curse it at the root. Yeah. Yes, sir. yeah. And so not even recognizing that in, even on a, uh, a, a low social economic status for, for a family to come to church and not need a ride to church that Sunday because they got a new car or because they got bus money that week. And so really not minimizing what is happening within the context of our ministries, what's happening in the context of our communities because our communities are in need. And because they are in need, how is it that we are relevant to our communities? Is it another church that they need? Do they need a community center instead of mm. a, a, a church? Do they need someone that's feeding them food, the, the natural food, mm -hmm. so that they're interested in figuring out the God that we're talking about? And so I think us understanding what the mission statement is, and as we said, being all things, and so just being relevant in those ways. Wow. And piggybacking off of that, I find that with the community, we try to pull people in, but you can't cultivate if you're uncultured. And I find that when we have these opportunities to reach out to people and we have a unique purpose, we have to not necessarily compare to the relevancy. We can't compare to the platforms, but we have to be our unique self. The best way to stand out is to be yourself. You are designed only one of you that God made in his divine image for you to be out in these streets helping the community, helping the church, helping the people, and it starts with you. And I find that a lot of people, we always say that jealousy is the thief of all joy, but comparison is the thief of all progress. And at the end of the day, we have to come together, know ourselves, because if we have a divine purpose and we, if we are staying in our lane and trying to switch lanes of comparison, we are going to crash our destiny. Wow, that's good. I, I wanna, go, Al, go ahead, and then uh, I wanna move on. I just on. have just this to say, let's get to work. We're having the conversations. I mean, we're having the conversations. We know the issue. Let's get to work and stay committed to the work because that's the only way we're going to be able to change this narrative, specifically dealing with black church and black and brown people. I love it. I love it. Let's, let, let's, let's get ready to close out here. Um, at the end of the day, we know that the word of God is our final authority, right? 
Um, heaven and earth is going to pass away, right. but that word is going to stand forever. Yes. In the word, it challenges us and tells us, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. I think that in a young leader's conversation, we have to touch on this, and this is where we'll end. Maybe we'll come back and do this again another time. But what is the line between conforming and adapting? Because certainly, while we're clear, there's no debate, Scripture tells us not to conform. But we have to adapt our methods, our approaches, some of our systems, some of our strategies, if we're going to be effective. But What's the line between conforming and adapting? What, what do you all say to that? Pastor Tyson? Um, I think that when, when we deal with conformity, and, and we talked about this earlier, um, I believe that once the, the vision for the kingdom becomes compromised, um, that's when we start moving into conformity. Um, the, idea, the idea has to be the same. Um, no matter what generation it is, the objective is still the kingdom vision. But once we start conforming to the ideologies of men and the, the perspectives of men and mm -hmm. the desires of men, we have completely almost blotted out the desire uh, for, the vision, for the vision of the kingdom mm -hmm. to be imposed in the earth. Uh, so I think that we have to really um, get grounded back into what is the vision for the kingdom as opposed to um, what do we want for church this week. Mm. I think that, that's where we really have to see, uh, see it clearly. Okay. Pastor Hawkins? I would add to Pastor Tyson, I, th I think that was amazing. Um, uh, the, the idea that, that um, adapting is, is, was the work of Jesus, yes, that he literally adapted, but he never conformed. Yeah. Uh, so he, he did it, and he laid it out specifically for us. Uh, I think the idea that it is okay to be viable, uh, uh, to be pliable, to be um, uh, flexible, in, in our methods, as it's been stated, uh, but having a focus on the mission, and that is uh, the word of God, um, and literally uh, being okay with the word of God ruling uh, in our business. I have an opportunity in, in my profession, uh, and I've had had the opportunity in my profession outside of, I'm a bivocational pastor, uh, to literally lead prayer in the workplace, in the marketplace, but, but God allowed me to adapt to the individuals that were there and to, um, in a, I don't want to say sneak way, but in a way, literally the word of God. And, and we see so many people have been doing this for years where they take the word of God, they're multimillionaire, a multimillion dollar uh, motivational speakers, and they use the word of God. Yeah. Just don't it's, say Jesus. it's just us. We, we're afraid to bring that, that into the context of our business, and we got to get rid of that. We got to be okay with being who we are wherever we are. And I think that's how we'd be able to do so, so part of avoiding conforming or stepping into conforming is being unapologetic about who we are. Yeah. yeah. I go believe ahead. that you can, when you adapt, you, you can function where you are. So, you know, you go out into the land and you preach and teach Jesus. So when you go out, you adapt. But when you conform, you become something that you are not. So if we're walking together, I, am I becoming more like you or you're becoming more like me? When I conform, then I no longer have the name Jesus that I have. I think yeah, one of the I'm, ways that we conform is when we become lazy listeners but strong speakers. <laughs> because I think wow. whenever it is that Finger snaps. <laughs> Finger snaps. <laughs> Bars. <laughs> Bars, Marcus. Jay-Z. Jay-Z. <laughs> <laughs> no, Never one, mind. Go on. <laughs> one of the ways that it happens is the way that you grow is if you can suspend your ego to listen to someone else. What I had, I now have more when I listen to you. Yeah. But if I'm only a strong speaker but a lazy listener, all I'm left with after every conversation and every environment is my own thoughts. Yeah. So I watch to see what people are doing, and I conform to get the same reaction. When in essence, I haven't listened enough to strengthen my speech, and by itself, I can only build up wind or the Holy Spirit within myself by hearing from other people. And that actually connects like to what we said earlier, where conformity is born out of the lack of ideas. Yeah. So the only way, and YLC is a, is a prime example of something that is not conforming right. because it's leading by ideas. So when you lose ideas, that's when you begin to conform. So the question should be, where is the vision, where are the ideas coming from to ensure that you don't, you need to be a trailblazer. You're right. a trailblazer when you have the ideas, and we should be asking and seeking God for the ideas so we do not conform. 
I was thinking as well, a lot of times we look at conforming as being um, a church and world, but what if conforming was one generation from another generation previous? And what I mean by that is um, there's uh, the previous generation had a way of doing things. And he said, uh, when you run out of ideas, then um, conforming becomes easy. But what if there um, is a new way to be able to reach as far as the methodology and the way we reach the world as, uh, um, as opposed to using the same methodology that is antiquated? So I was looking at it from that angle as well. Yeah. I'm big on definition and that, um, com that conformity deals with rudiments, it deals with patterns, it deals with literally the time of beat is being set as a system to reach an intended goal. And I think Jesus gave us a perfect model that the goal was the same was to get the people into the kingdom. But Jesus' yeah. criticism against the Pharisees and the Sadducees was you won't get out the way. Your system is broken. So if they were to follow the rudiment that had already been laid out that the people were used to, he said nobody is going to get to the goal. So he had to create a new pattern, a new beat essentially for That's the good. world to follow. And so Jesus is basically underlined that if we're not willing to adapt and that adaptation really relates to I'm going to stand flat footed and and honestly condemn the system that's in play because it's not going to get the people to the kingdom. Wow. So I think adapting is very necessary and I think we all do it in our own ways. I know um, back at home I have the opportunity to, to speak in various spaces and one of those spaces that I really have to adapt to is when I'm asked to speak into a Presbyterian church. Mm. And so you have 15 minutes uh, to deliver a message. That Presbyterian 15 it, minutes is 15 minutes. It, it, and it's 15 minutes. And so I have to, in, in addition to that, from our culture, we're not oftentimes used to putting our text on the screen, your, your points on the screen. And so before the week before, you have to have all of that submitted to them so that they know and they can follow through. And so knowing the relevance of being able to step in a platform like that, I have to adapt to their culture to bring what it is or what they believe is necessary uh, or what it is that I offer. And so adapting is necessary if we're going to be effective. Go ahead, on, oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. What yes, I wanted sir. to say was, first, we have to understand what adapt and conforming is. Just like you said, when I think about conforming, I think about a chameleon. A chameleon goes into a habitat and it changes to that particular habitat. Mm. But when you think about adapting, I'm going into a habitat to adapt, to see what's going on so that I can bring about yeah. change. And so this is what Jesus did. Jesus came onto the scene to see what was going on so that he then could bring about the change. So that not only did they conform to him, but they brought he brought about a shifting in the atmosphere. So when we understand that adapting is to conform them to us, then we understand why it's able, why we're supposed to adapt to change. Listen, these are the kinds of conversations, these are the kinds of thoughts that are being birthed at the Young Leaders Conference. Listen, we have to let you go and get back to what you were doing. Thank you to the Word Network for letting us have this space, but I do want to challenge you. If you have not yet made that decision to go to exploreylc.com and register, I need you to do it tonight. Over. 5,000 people from around the world are coming to grow in ministry, media, and the marketplace. And we would love to have you in the number. We love you. We are praying for you. We're believing God's best for your life. We'll see you next week in Atlanta. God bless you.